Hello, it's David. Something new today. You right, might remember, a couple of videos ago, we did a, uh, a little hack project on the STE. Uh, we had a, an adapter board for the PLCC uh, CPU to the DIP64. Uh, I put a 16 megahertz uh, CPU in there and I uh, applied a little clock hack using a, um, a, cu a couple of fly wires and a breadboard uh, to uh, and a, a CPLD um, uh, development board uh, to uh, to get it to run at 16 megahertz, switching the clock up and down when it accessed uh, the motherboard, and uh, that worked. It was uh, it was fine, but what we uh, what we saw was you really didn't get very much benefit at all, sort of of the order 10, 12 percent, because all the access to everything else on the board is still occurring at 8 megahertz. That's memory, that's peripherals, and the important thing with the 68000 it doesn't have a cache. So in effect it's everything. So you really don't see much unless it's doing some like intensive numerical calculations that don't require access to memory, which is not many. So I thought I'd knock together a little board and uh, that's what this is uh, and it's going to try and address some of those problems. So what we have here is a uh, a board with two 68000 uh, DIP64 sockets on it. Um, we're going to put pins in uh, the left half and we're going to put uh, pin headers sockets in the, the right half so that it's going to plug in where a, um, a chip would and the chip actual chip is going to piggyback on top and we're going to uh, start to uh, to do some things with it so this is going to be a CPLD we've got some three volt buffers up here uh, and if we flip it over there's going to be a great big RAM chip in the middle there so power regulator crystal that's about it bus pull ups around the side few bypass capacitors and what have you. Uh, some test points down the bottom and this is our programming header. That's all it is. So the idea being we will uh, we'll have 8 megabytes of, uh, actually I think I'm going to put a 16 meg chip on there just because I don't have an 8 megabyte one yet, but 8 megabytes of, of RAM uh, addressable, CPLD doing the, uh, uh, the RAM access and the uh, speed switching we're going to clock it at 32 or 64 megahertz uh, and we're going to divide that down so that the CPU runs at 16 when it's accessing the RAM which runs at full speed and uh, drops down to 8 when it accesses uh, the motherboard. That's the plan anyway I've just called this DSTB1 for now David's ST booster uh, but uh, we uh, we might come up with a better name for that uh, in the uh, in the long term but for now Let's get on with building it and uh, we'll see how far we get with this first uh, revision prototype.
Okay, so what's happened? Why it's happened? What can we do about it? Got to the point where I'd finished assembling all of the uh, SMD components on the board here. Uh, the, uh, the CPRDs in place, the two buffers, uh, all the various uh, passives, the crystal, uh, the, the memory chip itself, and the, uh, the voltage regulator. I haven't done the, um, uh, the pull-up um, resistors because my board already has them installed, so they're optional in, in my case. And so I'd come to, uh, to soldering on the, uh, the headers. Now the idea was, with, the, uh, uh, with these headers, that the 68000 would sit on the uh, the right pair and the left pair would have pin headers to plug into the uh, the adapter board that we've seen before. Now as I was coming to uh, to get the alignment I was happy with the alignment for the uh, the um, you know the parallelization of uh, the sockets and as I was coming to do the pins and I thought the best way to get the alignment right for the pins was to actually put it uh, or to you know just align them uh, gently into the, the socket here uh, and tack down so one straight I was going to tack down the other one and, and get started and I saw this uh, the hole does not line up oh dear so Here's what's happened. I've put the wrong footprint down when designing the board. Um, I know exactly how it's happened, I can remember it now. Uh, basically, I was throwing down a footprint in uh, KiCad before I'd fin finalized the design, throwing down a footprint uh, uh, to just get a feel for the layout and how we were going to fit things in. Uh, and it was my lunch break. I didn't have any reference material here with me. I didn't have a, um, a ruler with me and I didn't look it up on uh, on the internet what the uh, the actual pin width of a 68000 is and I guessed there were two options I guessed one and I meant to come back and review that later of course that was on my lunch break by the time I came back later on in the evening I'd forgotten that I'd guessed and uh, the layout came together so quickly I never went back to check so this is actually one tenth of an inch too wide. Both of these um, these rows, these dip 64 rows, are a tenth of an inch wider than they're supposed to be. So there should be so many tenths of an inch between the two, I don't know what it is. Uh, but instead, uh, these are uh, one too far apart. So, there we go, the dip pitch on here is 22.6 millimeters, and on my one it is 25.2. So there's your problem. <sighs> Pride before the fall. Uh, now the issue of course is that even if I rebuild it with now the correct footprint, this just fits. The CPLD only just squeezes between uh, the um, uh, between the two headers there, the header going down and the header coming up. Uh, if I have, if I come another tenth of an inch in, which is what would be required to, to, to fit uh, two in the same uh, configuration as this, the CPLD won't fit. So, uh, and I do need a, uh, this is a, a Xilinx um, 95144, I do need the 144, the 72 doesn't, I can't get the SD RAM controller into the 72. Maybe I could with a lot more efficiency enhancements, but uh, I'm not an expert on the Verilog programming. So I was really hoping for this one, and I've used virtually all the pins anyway. So to shift down to the uh, the 70, uh, the 72 or the 64 pin package, whatever the one down is, to shift down to that would be um, awkward. But what can we do in the meantime? So the, uh, the you know that how I move on to the, the next revision is is still up, up in the air but so what can I do in the meantime it, fortunately uh, it turns out that I have placed the um, the, the uh, offset socket headers if you like I have placed them a tenth of an inch apart they're a tenth of an inch offset from the other ones so it turns out 
that actually my two narrow rows of uh, of pins are the right pitch and down this side every single one of these pins is connected to every single one of these pins there's a one-to-one -one mapping there's no um, there's, there's, there's not been split out via the CPLD which which does happen down this side so what I propose to do is to remove this uh, socket header connection here uh, and fit my row of pins into its holes and then that should clip into my that way around, should clip into my um, adapter board now of course that will leave me then with uh, a pair of headers that are now two tenths of an inch uh, too wide but that's no difference one tenth of an inch isn't going to fit two tenths of an inch is still not going to fit I would need to build some kind of adapter so I think what I'll have a go at is trying to get this off trying to put my pin uh, header on in its stead and um, I'll remove this one as well and what we'll uh, what we'll look to do uh, is to try and build up with a bit of proto board an adapter that will sit on the top of this and convert it back to the correct pitch so I can at least put my CPU in it's going to be absolutely no good for production but it might at least let me develop my firmware which is what I was hoping to do in the first place now this the, 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 the piggybacking the CPU is obviously the only way that I could get the CPU on here to work um, it's not the primary um, design purpose of this um, really I was knocking something together because Exos wanted some SD RAM in a 68000 format to run actually as an external ST RAM booster to plug into a separate socket on his H4 board. Uh, so uh, this would still do that, but unfortunately I have no way of uh, bringing it up at my end uh, because, say, the, the piggyback chip is not there. Now, obviously, I could get like a a board that provides two 68,000 sockets, one here, one there. You know, the problem is, I'm if I want to do any any um, acceleration myself, I need to break out um, a couple of pins. So there are a few pins that are broken out on this side. So it, it kind of does need to come from this board. So what I'll end up with is a stack. What I hope to end up with is a stack with another adapter board on top of here. We'll put some longer sockets on here. Uh, build an adapter board on top of that, and then the CPU will go on top of that again. So. <laughs> Uh, a salutary lesson and uh, check your check your footprints let's see how we can get on Okay, so here's where we are. Um, I've reconfigured the uh, the board uh, to have the pin headers, the correct spacing, to fit into the uh, 68000 adapter. Uh, and I've put uh, relocated the sockets to the outside strip so I can put an adapter on. Um, the idea being these two sides, uh, sorry, these two sides are completely interchangeable. So it doesn't matter that the pins are here instead of here. That, that'll work just fine. This side I can just invert the logic. So uh, where I was expecting to see uh, clock in, for example, on one of these pins, it's and clock out was going to be this pin, and I'll swap them over in the CPLD. So that should be fine. Now, unfortunately, halfway through uh, that work, my um, desoldering pump clogged up. So I paused to clean out the nozzle, cleaned it. When I plugged it back in, it tripped all the power in the house did it a second time, tripped the power in the house. So I suspect I've killed my 
uh, desoldering pump, which is annoying. So then I moved on to trying to do it the old fashioned way with uh, a regular solder sucker, uh, a bit of braid and the soldering iron and uh, to, to remove, that is, uh, to remove the, uh, the socket I'd already put in. Um, that didn't work. That, uh, that made an absolute, uh, I just wasn't very good at it at all. Um, Steve made a comment on the Exos forums that I'm uh, that my soldering is not necessarily uh, the best he's ever seen. Well, Steve, you should see my desoldering. That's even worse. So anyway, I got the hot air gun out and I uh, blasted the uh, the base to try and pull these out. And unfortunately, I've toasted, absolutely toasted the board here. <laughs> so um, yeah, not my not my greatest work, but they do all buzz out. So we need to uh, create an adapter board. Uh, that's going to slot into this and let me put the uh, 68,000 in. So what I'm going to do is take a bit of uh, strip board here. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, well, it's long enough that way, but the strips are going the wrong way. I obviously want to have connections from uh, here back to a point where, uh, you know, effectively um, something in line with this. So I want the connections to run this way, and that's not quite long enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hacksaw a bit of that off. Unfortunately, the, the pitch is ruined here, so I've got to also hacksaw the ends off here, uh, and join a bit on, uh, and then uh, I shall solder in my my pin headers to the uh, to the board. And I don't have a sixty-eight thousand socket. I was going to use these, but those were my last ones. So uh, now I'm out of uh, of these little turn pin um, socket strip. So what I plan to do is this. So what I've got here is uh, two DIP32 sockets, uh, 32 pins. So I need two of these back to back. But of course, the pitch there is, is wrong. So what I'm going to have to do is to slice this down the middle and then solder them onto my uh, reconstituted, you see that's, uh, that's two pieces joined together there, solder them onto my reconstituted uh, strip board. I also need to cut down the middle of the, uh, the strip board as well to isolate the two sides. Uh, but then that will give me pins coming out the bottom and these sockets here. And what I might do, I'm going to have to have a, have a look and see, because unfortunately it's only on one side to the copper. I'm going to have to have a look at this and see whether I can uh, solder the same side as the pins. Might be able to because there's a bit of exposed there, uh, something like that maybe. Or alternatively, what I can do is to splay the legs on my uh, socket here and effectively make it uh, an SMD component and uh, just have the legs pointing out on the top side. Oops, sorry. Have the legs pointing out on the uh, on the top side here of the uh, the strip board, so that I can solder them on, effectively making the through hole into an an, uh, an SMT part. So uh, that's the next step. You can see that I've had the uh, the hacksaw to this to um, no, wait, no, that way around. I've had the hacksaw to this to make this, and what I've done is I've cut down the line of holes. Uh, the idea being, obviously, there'll be um, copper on both sides. So when I come to solder this, I just have to make sure well, one, it joins up and two, I flood the, uh, the both halves with uh, solder such that um, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a good electrical contact. So that's what we're going to try. Unfortunately, I ran out of uh, storage on my uh, on my camera here. Um, whilst I was in the process of making this, I didn't realise. So uh, you've uh, you've lost some of this, I'm afraid. Now this is clearly an absolute monstrosity, uh, but the pins look straight enough in that direction. They look a bit bowed in that direction, but I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, I've buzzed it all out. 
uh, and it does seem to, uh, to have continuity in all the right places and no continuity in all of the places it shouldn't. Um, and this really is a very, very clunky adapter. But hey, come on, it's got to be in keeping with the rest of the project so far, eh? What an absolute shambles this has been. <laughs> anyway, so whether I'll ever get my chip out of this again is, uh, is anyone's guess. But with luck, we should now finally be able to mount with a little bit of uh, persuasion, my 68,000 chip. There we go. <laughs> my 68,000 chip into there. And then the idea is that this uh, fits into here. Now I'm not going to push that in just yet. I'm going to go and program up my um, CPLD first. <laughs> but look, there we go. I think it just about look how look how crooked that is. I think that just about uh, that just about fits. And with luck, there's another there's another layer of. Uh, Incredul incredulity to, uh, to pile onto this with the uh, uh, with the PLCC uh, adapter. So all of this just to emulate another sixty-eight thousand, uh, which should let's pin one up that end, then fit into this one with a little bit of gentle persuasion, and we're going to end up with the stack from hell. Now I'm going to push, uh, put my neck out here and suggest that I'm not sure that the uh, the floppy disk drive is going to continue to fit uh, with <laughs> with this monstrosity in place. Um, but anyway, here's where we program our um, CPLD up. So I think I could probably safely squish all that together now and program up the CPLD, but I think for safety's sake I'm, uh, I'm going to do it first so that there's nothing that's shorted out. We haven't applied um, positive to a ground line or something silly like that on the CPU. I don't want to try and kill that. So as I said before, I've just got to reverse the um, uh, reverse some of the logic that I've, that I've built up in the simulator so that um, you know clock in is clock out and, and uh, AS in is AS out. And all I'm going to do, I'm not going to use the uh, the, the crystal on the back or the oscillator on the back, I'm not going to use the RAM at all. All I'm going to do first of all is to try and get it to connect um, all of the pins that I've broken to uh, their corresponding pins such that, so that's like the clock line, the AS line, data strobes, etc., um, the E line, the VPA, the VMA. Uh, so to get them all just uh, cross uh, connected and talking to each other so that I, I can hopefully put this stack completely together, fit it in the STE, and we should just get it booting at stock 8 megahertz speed. If I can't get it booting at 8 megahertz speed with no additions, then I've done something wrong. And I have to come back and double check on my soldering here. I'm going to take some high resolution photos of uh, my SMD work uh, before we get started. Uh, and that will just uh, you know, serve in lieu of a microscope to make sure that I haven't got any solder bridges or anything silly before I start. Wish me luck. Okay, so my enormous Tower of Babel uh, did managed to boot. Uh, we did have an intermittent fault with um, a couple of the address lines uh, sort of um, having a bit of a short on them. Um, it didn't happen all the time but um, as it got warmer or you know I moved it around slightly uh, I'd basically get uh, a screen instead of the boot screen I'd get um, rows of alternate, uh, alternating colour and 16 pixels wide. Did give away that there's something on the one of the uh, either one of the data uh, bits or one of the address lines. So uh, took it apart, resold it, cleaned it up a bit, and that, that's, uh, that seems to be sorted out. But when working with the SD RAM, run into a problem that one of uh, the, uh, basically, every fourth um, uh, address was re um, returning the same thing as the address uh, prior to it. So um, normally that would imply I've made a mess of the, the logic for the, the SD RAM down here um, because I've you know got the wrong pin set up or something. But 
in this case there was no possible way it's only bit uh, there's only uh, you know a3 it only ever uh, points to one place so there's 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 no way that could be uh, inadvertently or configured for the long size memory or something like that so the most obvious thing is that perhaps the one of the address lines is not getting through to the cpld so it's activating the wrong uh, address on the uh, the chip because obviously that's all getting translated through the cpld because there's rows and columns as opposed to uh, you know sram where it would just map through directly or, or rom or something like that so uh down in this corner here is where we've got uh, our um lower address lines so these do connect i've got my uh, beeper here so these do connect to uh, the cpld or should do so if i go from uh, this corner pin here and just check on the cpld here we've got a connection uh, try the next pin up silence third pin so turns out that's a3 doesn't have a connection to the cpld so um Hopefully I'll just put on the screen here uh, the map of that trace, but it's a fairly basic trace. It comes straight out of the uh, the pin, runs on the bottom, runs up to the CPLD. So somewhere in there we've got a breakage. Now, it looks pretty clean to me when I take a bit of a high res of it, so the most likely spot is just where it joins that pin. Uh, it's got to be said that the, the, um, uh, the upper uh, socket and the lower pin are connected, otherwise we wouldn't get any boot at all. Uh, but it's just that route to the CPLD that's failing. So uh, I'm just going to have a bit of a go under the uh, under magnification, see if I can see any break here, see if I can see anything wrong with the solder point here, maybe scrape a little bit of the mask off and uh, look for some continuity, perhaps halfway, perhaps at each end, that kind of thing. Uh, and if there's a chance to scrape it back and just uh, patch it with a little bit of solder, then that's what I'll, uh, that's what I'll do. Right, so I think I found the problem. And sure enough, it's uh, this pin here, right at the very, right at the very base of the pin. Uh, there's no connection to the the trace, so I've scraped away a tiny bit of uh, of trace there. Oh, sorry, a tiny bit of the uh, um, solder mask. I don't know if you can hear that, we've now got a connection. So. All I really have to do is to put a big enough blob of solder here that just catches that trace and get it onto that pin, and that should hopefully do the job. Okay, so we've done a lot of building so far, so I thought maybe it was time for a little bit of a show and tell. So here we have uh, the assembled prototype stack. So this is the uh, PLCC to uh, DIP64 adapter uh, that we um, spoke about and built previously. Uh, my little experimental prototype board is uh, plugged into that. Now, because I got my uh, pitch wrong on the um, the dip chip, I've had to have a little bit of a reconfiguration, and this is the um, adapter board that I've got then set on top of that. And on top of that is my uh, 16P uh, 68000 processor. Now, a little bit of jiggly pokery on the uh, firmware, but nothing uh, too particularly clever. Oh, and there's a whole load of sorry, um, test leads just soldered onto the side here, so I can monitor things. And this scramble of wires here is actually my um, logic analyzer, but there's nothing too smart going on in uh, the uh, in the firmware. Uh, just the clock switching uh, routine that we we saw before, and I've added my SD RAM, adapted my SD RAM from uh, controller from uh, the uh, the DFB one, which is in turn based on Stephen Leary's um, Terrible Fire three thirty uh, controller, uh, and uh, all that sort of just. Uh, wedged together there in no particular ceremony and uh, and here we are this is what we uh, this is what we've um ended up with this is uh, this is running quite nicely it's this info here uh you can see our uh memory there we go we've got eight uh eight megabytes of alt ram it says tt ram it's not tt ram it's uh, it's alt ram um and that's uh, that's being detected quite nicely have to just a little um a program in the auto folder to uh uh, to pick that up, we can do. It. This is nothing particularly optimized at the moment. This is uh, this is all um, not applicable ST RAM. That's all. 
I was running a game before, maybe it's uh, maybe it's messed up. So nothing particularly, uh, well, normally STRAM is 3.7 megabytes per second. So here we are, we're at 5.7, we're not particularly optimized. This is using a 32 uh, megahertz um, oscillator, which is not the optimum. Ideally, you want to be at 66, divide down some more. So it's a 32 megahertz oscillator, uh, halving its clock for 16 megahertz for the CPU, driving the RAM at uh, 32. Uh, and then we obviously step down to eight megahertz when we're talking to the system board. So the performance benefits that we see from here are mostly when we uh, we are talking to all RAM, of course. So there we go. So the light performance is a little bit disappointing. Uh, I've got some tricks up my sleeve that I, I hope to uh, employ for that, but that's just because of the difference uh, between the 68000 and the 030. The 030 writes is faster than the read uh, on the uh, 68000. Um, uh, read is faster than the write if you don't employ any uh, special little tricks. And that's just because the data strobe uh, lines, i.e. The, when, it, when it drives uh, the data on the bus, comes later in the uh, 68000 rather than the, the 030. So um, that's a touch, a touch disappointing at the moment. Uh, but um, yeah, the STRAM figures are not to say I need to have cold boot. Uh, but that's, uh, normally it's 3.7. So there we go, we can see where we get uh, the bonus. Uh, now, whilst that's, I'll just take you through the boot up procedure so you can see um, what's that, what it actually entails. Uh, but uh, I haven't hacked toss or anything, so it doesn't, um, uh, uh, it doesn't do anything um, built into the system. We have to run a program. But there we go. So that's uh, just loaded eight megabytes of alt RAM at uh, address uh, five zero 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 zero. Incidentally, I tried to add it at four zero 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 zero, and TOS just kept on detecting it as ST RAM. And the machine ran, but there was no graphics because it was um, beyond uh, what the uh, what the shifter could read. Um, I need to ask in the forums actually what the dumb thing is there. Whether I'm supposed to wait until TOS has issued two bus errors and, and then enable it, or I, I don't know. I haven't really worried about that because I've only I'm only targeting eight megabytes, and so I can just move it up a megabyte. And it's fine. So uh, that that works uh, that works quite nicely. So uh, we can run GenBench. We've got an alt RAM version of GenBench here. Uh, we can run it from alt RAM. See, there we go. Uh, and when we do our inter di integer division now, we should get something uh, approximating 200%, probably 190, 195 would be good. 190, 192 would be good. I think we were getting 189, weren't we, on the, uh, with the simple clock switching. There we are, 199. Brilliant, that's very good. Um, if we do a alt RAM speed test, uh, well, we've just seen this. This is this is uh, running at uh, about one and a half times speed, I think, something like that. So three point seven plays five point something, five point seven, wasn't it? But then we had a slightly slower um, write performance. So we're we're looking at somewhere around the the hundred and fifty percent mark, I think, uh, compared to, and that's compared to sort of a stock ST RAM speeds. Uh, so the only reason, and probably what we should see is uh, a slightly slower uh, integer division performance if we run from STRAM, and that's because um, there's no cache obviously on the 68000, so the instructions themselves will take longer to run when running from STRAM as opposed to running from uh, uh, alt RAM. And so that's probably, I'm expecting to get our figure of around 180 is it 189, 182, I can't remember, something like that that we got last time. There we go, 186. So we get a slower um, speed measurement on the processor, even though it's identical, but just because we're running from STRAM. So I'm just going to boot up into uh, Mint a little bit here, and or Multitos, I should say, and uh, and show you uh, how uh, some of the, uh, the signals um, work on here. Now I've tried to get my Mint installation to boot, but for some reason, as in the more modern um, version of Mint, but for some reason um, I get a uh, an error when uh, when booting that. I need to ask on the forums what that uh, uh, what that means. But you can see the old school Multitos uh, that boots up uh, just fine. We can run. Uh, oh, that was our. Uh, Memory tester, we can run that in a window happily. Uh, 
Um, I'll just let that go through one uh, one pass quickly, or the, at least the first pass, just to uh, just to show uh, no errors. And in fact, while that's running, let's talk about the signals. So over here on the Mac, I've got uh, the logic analyzer uh, set up, and uh, this is monitoring a few different lines. So uh, over in this corner, we can see what's actually being monitored. So address strobe, DTAC, the clock. This I'll explain a little bit in a minute. And then these ones down here are related to the uh, S, uh, SD RAM. So if I just pause that for a second, this is running the test in the back when it's actually finished that first pass. If we zoom in on AS, so you can see here, uh, AS goes low, DTAC follows basically one cycle later on, but it takes 312 nanoseconds for the AS cycle to, to complete. And here's our clock, uh, running down here, this is a 125 nanosecond clock, this is at 8 megahertz, but look over here, we can see a little burst of 16. When this goes high, I wait a little while in case there's an immediate one straight away like here, for example. This goes low, it goes high, it goes low again. Oh, sorry, it's off screen. This goes uh, high, goes low again. I wait a minute before, or I wait a couple of cycles before switching back to 16 just to avoid any sort of glitching there. Or just, you know, general, uh, general slowdown. But if we have a nice long break, so here we've gone, here we've gone low, here we've gone low, here we've gone high for 500 nanoseconds, and we managed to squeeze in some extra cycles here before we go low again. Now that's access to normal STRAM, but what do we have over here? You'll see the extra lines come in. This one is an alt RAM access. Uh, this is the first alt RAM access. The uh, address strobe goes low, and you can see that we start switching to 60 megahertz, but it takes a few seconds. This down here is my um, my row address select, and these are, this is my column address select. And so we eventually get valid data on, on the bus about here. We've preempted it by asserting DTAC early. Doesn't get read until there, so everything's fine. It's not synchronous, unlike the 68,030. This one we kind of have to preempt it a bit if we want to um, get decent speed. But because we've gone into a second, this is obviously a uh, a long word access because we've gone uh, into a second read straight away it stays at 16 megahertz and this is where you get the boost this is down to a 219 second cycle time so that was 250 219 and then we compare it with a uh, stram access of 312 so 219 312 that's where you get that 50 percent speed bonus and this is what basically happens the speed goes up and down where it can and when we access alt RAM, it runs after the, f the first one's, you know, hot, uh, uh, kind of like two thirds speed, and then it gets, actually that one's done very well, and then it gets into the, uh, the full run of it. And you can see all of these alt RAM accesses as we're using uh, the, uh, the testing program here, Yart from Christian. So we can let that run in real time. Um, and we'll come back to that other line in a moment. So we can see that that's, that's running through. Uh, that's all very happy. No problems there. And our uh, sysinfo should still show uh, our approximately eight megabytes free. Uh, it's pretty difficult to get the actual um, alt RAM figure allocated by the look of things. Um, no hardware seems to really pick that up unless it's registered right at the start. There we go. TT, it's not TT, but uh, nearly eight megabytes of additional RAM available there. Another day. Okay, so what are the actual benefits then of 60 megahertz and alt RAM, you know, 150% speed uh, alt RAM? Well, I thought a very clear demonstration last time was on Frontier, where we managed, uh, we ran at 60 megahertz with no fast RAM, and we only went from 850 frames for the introduction sequence to uh, 948, I think, something like that. So this is a, a good example. We're going to try this again. Now, while this is running through, I'm going to talk to you about this line here, which has suddenly popped up. 
Now this line here is basically my card decoding the uh, access to the um, shifter register. Now that you saw that was blank before, that's because GEM does not change the shifter register. All screen updates happen uh, in real time whilst you're watching them. It updates the live screen being uh, shown, that's why GEM can sometimes feel a bit slow. Most games on the other hand will use a double buffering technique. They'll draw one uh, frame in the background and then only switch to that frame when it's ready, which is why you get such, you know, these variable frame rates here, six frames per second we're showing here. Um, in order to switch that frame, it writes to the shifter register and tells it where to find the next frame. And it shifts backwards and forwards, so double buffering means there's two switches backwards and forward. And I know that's what Frontier does, and most games do. So what I've done is I'm just listening for that register and sending out a pulse when an access occurs on that register. So if we were to zoom in here, you'll see that this is a, here's a load of alt-ram access on this side, here's a load of alt-ram access on that side, here's a bit in the middle where there's no alt-ram access, and we're down at eight megahertz, and there is one right to the, um, the shifter register. And if we look at that, those two are separated by, that says, uh, 361 milliseconds. Uh, so that's just over 30 seconds. So we're talking three frames per second we're experiencing at that point. So basically what I have, <laughs> what I've got is a, uh, not only a visual representation of the frames per second, which coincides with this one up here, uh, but uh, one that I could actually count and provide a hardware count of the frames per second over a particular period. Why is that useful? Well, Frontier, we've I've hacked it to supply this, but what if we ran a different game that we'd like to see the effect of? And you can see the you can see the frames getting uh, <laughs> the, the the pin the the, uh, the the pulse is getting tighter and slower down. Look, it's dropping there as it goes down to six frames per second, and. Uh, four, three, it drops again, and then bang, up to high when we go to 16 frames per second. You see, it works, it, it, is, it is quite effective. And I can put a multimeter on that and it ties up uh, quite well, the, uh, the hertz count. In fact, why don't we do that now while it's running? But anyway, the, the, the point of this is that um, I can uh, then hopefully get a, a quantitative measure of um, of the difference that my accelerator makes to any particular game that I'm interested in. So this this here now is a uh, this is a, a hertz a, um, a frequency counter. So I'm just going to uh, ground that. You're picking up a background hum at the moment, mains background hum, and I'm going to attach it to my output counter. There we go. Look at that. Seven six point six. It says seven on the yeah seven. The two coincide very well. Ah, and there we go, we've got our final figure. 1,200, 1,208 frames. 850 is stock, 950 is 16 megahertz with no fast RAM. 16 megahertz plus fast RAM, 1,208. Now, uh, off the top of my head, that's about 150%. So you'll see that the vast majority of the speed benefit that you can get from an alt-RAM compatible game is by using faster RAM. It's all about RAM. CPU is very much a secondary thing in, in these, which we've known from the Falcon, but it's nice to see that confirmed again here with my hacky accelerator for the STE. Okay, so well, thank you very much for uh, for putting up with uh, this this ramble, but it's a little bit of a show and tell. Um, this is clearly not a finished product. Um, this will obviously all be open source when I've uh, when I've uh, got it nailed down. I'm thinking that I want the oscillator to be 66 or 64 uh, megahertz. So that's the next thing to move on to. I might try an external oscillator and, and just get the timings right. Um, clearly, uh, I just got my pitches wrong, so I'm working on a uh, on a newer version that uh, that should hopefully uh, sort that out. And I'm experimenting. I've put my Falcon booster, um, the next release of it, just on hold uh, temporarily because I'm experimenting with a different way of 
doing the uh, the alt ram and if it works on this board then i'll probably incorporate it into my next and hopefully public release version of the falcon board so so th this is not this, this is this is not stopping the falcon board this is actually helping it um, so what i'm hoping i'll do another spin of this uh, with the correct form factor so the cpu can sit just on top obviously the ste variant is 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 only just experimental but the stfm variant uh, would um, hopefully plug straight in um, clearance might be an issue that need, might need displacing displacement cards um, if uh, I was to do a, an ST version it would probably just be built straight in to be honest but I'd rotate it around that way so it sits behind the keyboard um, and uh, there we go you see that I am working on a uh, on a later on a later version and I promise you I've actually measured these now and they do fit <laughs> so um, i will print it out and put a chip on top of it before i get around to ordering that but there we go i hope you uh i hope you found that interesting progress so far and i'm going to carry on um, playing around with this and uh, and see what we can get this number up to so uh, we earned yeah 12 1208 is the uh, is the figure to beat so far 144 percent on the ram um i'm hoping we can get up near that 200 figure. Okay, thank you very much, speak to you soon.